Thank you, Daniel and worship team. Well, I'm Pastor Brian, and I'm usually at our South Street campus, but it's great to be back with all of you again here at Kesslinger. Uh, many of you know that my wife and I have four sons, grown now, but when they were much younger, we went through several phases of family pets until we finally got a dog. We kind of had to work our way up through the different pets. We had a hamster phase. Uh, we had a lizard phase. We actually had two lizards uh, named Kobe and Shaq. If you know, you know. Um, we had a turtle for a few days that the boys found in our backyard. And we had a fish phase. We had a whole series of goldfish. I say we had a whole series because we had incredibly bad luck keeping those goldfish around very long. Uh, the goldfish would do well for a few days, and then within a week or so, inevitably, one of our boys would find a goldfish floating in the tank, and we'd have to have a somber bathroom burial at sea, if you know what I mean. Finally, I decided the problem might be the quality of goldfish I was buying. So I went back to the pet store and decided to upgrade. I saw uh, a, a fancy goldfish displayed, I mean, I mean a high-end, bougie goldfish, uh, three times the cost of what I had been spending because it came with a really cool guarantee. The sign said that if anything happened to the goldfish within two weeks, uh, the purchaser could return it, no questions asked, for a free replacement fish. Boom, sold. Bought that goldfish. But I think we had to use that guarantee like three times <laughs> until it became just too embarrassing for me to take yet another dead goldfish in a little plastic bag back to the return counter and claim my new fish. I dreaded the look on the employee's face. Like, you again? Like, what exactly are you doing to these goldfish? They never said it out loud, but I could tell they were thinking it. So we might smile at the guarantee of a replacement goldfish, uh, but we all know that life, our lives, the lives of our loved ones, doesn't come with a replacement guarantee. Or does it? Today we look at a story that's about just such a promise. Now we're wrapping up our summer long series. This is the 11th week of our series called Face to Face, Stories of Meeting Jesus. We've been looking at this whole series of stories from the Gospels about all kinds of people coming face to face, having an interaction with Jesus of Nazareth. All kinds of people, from a lonely Samaritan woman at a well, to a diseased, leprous man, to a greedy, short tax collector, uh, to a Roman centurion, a soldier. And in most of these stories, transformation happens when they meet Jesus. They are forgiven, they're healed, they're made clean, made new. Like the character Mary Magdalene says in the series, The Chosen, I was one way and now I'm completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. But we've also seen that not every story that we've looked at ends in salvation or transformation. Two weeks ago, we saw the story of the wealthy young man called the rich young ruler who came to Jesus looking for eternal life, saying, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But he walked away sad, turned his back on that encounter because he couldn't bear to surrender the false idol of his wealth, his possessions. Last week, Pastor Jeff looked at the story of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor at the time, who tried to avoid making a decision about Jesus, but ended up being remembered as the man who sent Jesus to the cross. Jeff called it the inescapable question of Jesus. I like that. Today we look at the story of two men, one who received the promised guarantee of life with Jesus and one who did not. We're gonna pick up the story in Luke's Gospel, chapter 23. Jesus has been arrested. Pilate has turned him over to be crucified. And Luke writes these words, beginning in verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. 
and they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. We're going to see several things here today, but the first thing I want us to see is that the story begins with the place of death. In the place of death. So today is the final day of the Olympic Games in Paris. The closing ceremonies are this evening, I believe. How many have been watching at least some of the Olympics? Just raise your hand. Oh, a lot of you. Now, we have been watching at our house. We, I mean, we got started watching, and we watch pretty much every night, 7 o'clock, we're there watching the Olympics. In fact, we watched the Olympics so much that I was, had this urge to begin the message today with... <laughs> I got to tell you, my wife, I told my wife I was going to do that, and she was like, eh. <laughs> Might have been right. But a few years ago, my wife and I had a chance to make a bucket list trip to Europe, and we visited Paris. And while we were there, we decided to take a day-long side trip to Normandy, uh, where the D-Day invasion took place in June of 1944. Uh, that's what it looked like then, the largest military sea invasion in human history. And this is what it looks like now. We took a picture there, it's peaceful, calm, hard to even fathom the chaos and violence that once took place there. While there, we also visited the American Cemetery. If you've had a chance to visit this place, you know it's an overwhelming emotional experience. The site is just overwhelming. Uh, there's over 9,000 grave markers covering 172 acres. It's an amazing sight. Today we remember Normandy and D-Day as the turning point and what led to victory in World War II. But that cemetery, seeing all those crosses with some stars of David mixed in, reminded us that it was first a place of death, not victory. Luke t tells us in verse 32, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. Now, the word Luke uses for criminals here means evil worker. Uh, both Matthew and Mark, who tell the same story, call them robbers or thieves, which carried the, the meaning of, of them being violent men. They were bad men. Verse 33, when they came to the place called the skull, now the word Luke uses here is cranion, from which we get our English word cranium. It just means skull. It refers to a hill just outside the ancient city walls of Jerusalem that was a place commonly used for executions for crucifixion. And they called it the skull. In, in Aramaic, it was Golgotha. In Latin, Calvary. Because either the hill resembled a skull or it simply symbolized and was a place of death. They crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. So let me pause there for a bit. Luke tells us that there were three men on three crosses, Jesus in the middle and two criminals on either side. Now, this story is actually etched deep into the DNA of Chapel Street Church. The three crosses uh, in the story are represented in all four of our campuses in our facilities. Let me show you. The exterior of South Street has this built right into the brick. The sanctuary of South Street has this up front, the three crosses. Here at this campus on the exterior of Kesslinger, we see the three crosses. We see them on the steeple tower way up to the top, if you look, the three crosses. We see them on the exterior of our Mill Creek campus and on our newest campus 
at North Aurora. And leave it up there for a moment. I want you, what I want you to see is not just the three crosses, but notice in each case, one of the side crosses is touching the center cross. And that's a symbolic representation of the great story we look at today. All three men have been tried and found guilty, the two criminals for violent crimes against Rome, and Jesus, who had been accused by the religious leaders of blasphemy, of making himself equal to God, and of calling himself a king, which was a political, political crime in Rome. Now, crucifixion, uh, the Roman cross, was an unimaginably brutal means of execution. We've all heard bits and pieces of it, but it was so revolting, even in that culture, that Roman citizens wouldn't mention it in polite company. And the Romans are the ones who invented and perfected it. It was too revolting, which is why Luke doesn't give us details of the actual crucifixion. He just says they crucified him there. One, because his readers would have all understood because they'd seen crucifixions. Secondly, because it would have been impolite to put it into words. It was intended not just to execute, to kill, but to inflict as much pain as possible, and even more than that, to utterly humiliate and degrade and dehumanize a human being and to do so publicly. From the perspective of Rome, the purpose of crucifixion was to intimidate and to ensure fear of Roman power. But from God's perspective, and for those of us who have put our faith in Jesus, the cross is a symbol of God's power to bring victory over sin and death through Christ's sacrifice. And it would be that for just one of these criminals. But before it became a symbol of victory, we need to see that the place of the skull was a place of death. The second thing we see is that this is also the place of forgiveness. The place of forgiveness. My mom was born and raised in a tiny mountain town in the hills of eastern Kentucky, Pike County, coal mining country. We would call it Appalachia. Uh, she became a believer at the age of 19 through the preaching of a lady missionary preacher who started a small church in her town with wooden benches on a dirt floor. Uh, she was the first believer in her entire family tree, we, we think, and soon she began sharing Christ wherever she could with her family members, mom, and dad, siblings, and many eventually came to faith through her witness, except for her grandfather, my great-grandfather, a man named Joseph Branham. She called him Grandpa Joe, and Grandpa Joe was uh, a scoundrel by any measure. He was a coal miner and a binging alcoholic who would disappear for weeks at a time, only to come home bragging about his extramarital infidelities, and then the whole process would start up all over again. But my mom loved her grandpa, and late in his life, when he was dying from black lung disease from his years spent in the coal mines, she went to visit him in the hospital, and she, she tried to share the gospel with her grandpa. When she told him that Jesus had died on the cross to forgive his sins, he said, there's just too many of them. He said, I don't have enough time to confess them all. And then she said, you don't have to name them all. You just have to confess you need Jesus. And then he said, daughter, and she was his granddaughter, but he called her daughter. Daughter, I'd be a coward to ask for forgiveness now. I need to take what's coming to me, he said. Verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they are doing, and they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and even the rulers sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. So we know the story. Jesus had been wrongfully accused. Uh, railroaded. He'd been arrested and, and sent through three different trials that weren't really trials at all. He's been beaten and flogged, and the Roman flogging or scourging was, was brutal enough to kill many men. He's been humiliated by Roman soldiers who threw a robe around his shoulders and jammed a, a crown of thorns on his head and mocked him as king of the Jews. He's been nailed to a wooden cross, and even then, 
onlookers, religious leaders, are sneering at him and taunting him, even then. And in the midst of all that, in that moment, Jesus utters the unexpected, shocking, and even scandalous words. Father, forgive them. Forgive them. Here we see the forgiveness of Jesus, what author Brennan Manning calls the relentless tenderness of Jesus. What I would call grace. Not grace as we often think of it, kind of a divine niceness, but grace as a power that shatters everything about who we are and what we have been and makes us new, new creatures, born again into a new life. And the forgiveness of Jesus, as we see it in this story, is always utterly undeserved and always a gift. That is, Jesus does not forgive on a curve. He doesn't forgive us on the basis of how good or bad we are in comparison to other people, which is how we judge ourselves. Well, I'm better than, I'm better than so-and-so. Jesus forgives not based on that. Jesus does not forgive based on how sorry we act like we are. He doesn't forgive on the basis of what we promise to do to earn it or to pay it back to him somehow. Jesus forgives only because of who he is and what he has done. In Romans chapter 5, Paul says it like this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What my great-grandfather needed to know most was that even with his substantial stack of sins, and it was substantial, that Jesus died for all of that, all of it. And that to ask for forgiveness was not cowardice. To fail to receive the forgiveness was cowardice. Because forgiveness is always a gift, and that's what this story's about. Verse 39, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, before we look at what I would call this man's cry of faith, I want to point out something that we can miss if we only read Luke's account of this story. If you read it in Matthew and Mark, who tell the same story of Jesus' death, they tell us that both criminals, the ones, man dying on the right and on the left, both of them mocked Jesus. But here in Luke, we see that one rebukes the other, which means something changed in this man. He went from hurling insults at Jesus right along with the crowd, right, right along with the other criminal, right along with the religious leaders to crying out to him, Jesus, remember me. So what changed? Now, we don't know this with certainty, but I think Luke gives us a hint. Back in verse 34 when he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. I think in that moment, something may have stirred in this man's heart and mind when he heard Jesus say those words. I mean, he knew he was a criminal. He knew he had done bad things. He knew he was a bad man. He knew he deserved the punishment he was receiving. And he knew by the end of the day, he was going to face the judgment of a holy God. But maybe, just maybe, this man on the middle cross could forgive him, too. Years ago, um, when I was senior pastor here, and we had just one campus, South Street, we had a children's ministry that met every Wednesday night. And one Wednesday night, I was at home because I wasn't involved in that ministry. I got a call from a leader in that ministry saying, Pastor Brian, could you come to church? There's a man here, a dad, who's, who's acting very strangely, who's agitated, and he's scaring the kids and all the leaders. Can you please come? 
when I tell this story, I, I say, you know, it was before Pastor Jeff was on our staff, but if he had been, I would have said, call Pastor Jeff. He's... <laughs> so when I got there, there was a man pacing back and forth in the lobby, talking out loud, like to himself or someone, clearly agitated and going through some sort of emotional distress. I, I convinced him to come back into my office, away from all the kids and the leaders, and I just tried to calm him down. And it's a really long story, but it turns out he was a Vietnam veteran having some kind of PTSD episode. And so I knew he needed help far beyond what I could give him. But I just sat with him for an hour or so, trying to get him to tell me what was going on in his mind and his heart. And eventually he told me parts of a story. He was 19 years old, serving in Vietnam, in combat, in battle. And he said he had done things so awful that he, he couldn't even put them into words for me. He just kept saying, you don't know, man. You don't know the things that I did. You don't know. And all he could say was, no, I don't. I don't. But Jesus does. And even though you can't forgive yourself, he has already forgiven you. This man on the cross does three things that we see here. First, he recognizes his own sin and guilt. He says, don't you fear God to the other? Since you're under the same sentence, we are punished justly for we're getting what our deeds deserve. He knows who he is, what he's done, what he deserves. Secondly, he recognizes Jesus as king. He says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The only people who have kingdoms are kings. And he also recognizes that Jesus' kingdom must, go, must extend beyond death itself because he's dying too. And thirdly, he recognizes his own personal need. He says, remember, not us, me. I think this story tells us that it's never too late to cry out to Jesus. And I think this can be encouragement to anyone, anyone here today um, who has a loved one or friend that you fear is so far from God that there's no hope. I don't think any of us know how many so-called deathbed conversions or end-of-life cries of faith actually happen. I think there are many, many, and I've experienced some of those. Years ago, a lady in our church asked me if I'd be willing to visit her mother who had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. And I told, said, sure, I'll, I'll visit her. And then she said, but I need to warn you. She said, my mom has never been very religious. Uh, she has never been to church. And she's really not a very nice person. <laughs> I said, well, have you asked her? Is she willing to have a visit from someone like me? She said, yeah, I asked her. And she surprised me. She said, yes. And that's how I met a lady named Charlotte. She was 79 years old. Uh, she knew she was dying, and her daughter was right. Charlotte was um, a rather bitter, older woman, foul-mouthed, and who had experienced a lot of pain in her life. But she let me visit, and I visited her every few weeks, and I could tell that she started to enjoy our conversations, um, even though she occasionally used bad words and things like that. Uh, she eventually even let me pray for her before I left. Then one day, I noticed several books on her coffee table, and all the books were about heaven. Her daughter had been bringing her books. And I said, oh, so have you been reading these books? She said, yeah, I have. I said, uh, maybe one of the things we can talk about when I come is, is how you can know more about heaven. She said, I'd like that. So we started talking about heaven and what it meant. And I got to tell her the story of Jesus and eventually, I thought she was ready, so I, I, printed, I, I wrote out a prayer of faith on my computer at home. I still have it. It's called Charlotte's Prayer. And I took it to her. We sat in her living room, and I said, Charlotte, I wrote this prayer out for you. I want to read it to you. I want to know if you want to pray this prayer today. So I read her this prayer of faith. I got finished. I said, do you want to say that prayer with me now? And she said, yes, I do. So we did. Charlotte died a couple of weeks later, um, but I believe Jesus answered that prayer. 
The third thing we see in this story is the place of promise. So we have the place of death, the place of forgiveness, and then the place of promise. Verse 43, Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Truly I tell you. The word used here actually is the Hebrew word amen that most of us use every day when we pray. And in this context, it means so be it or let it be. Or we might say for real or it's a done deal. Jesus is using it to make a promise. I want to take the words of his promise kind of in reverse order. He says, truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now, paradise there is the Greek word paradisos. It's actually a transliteration of an ancient Persian word that means park or walled garden. It refers to a place of beauty and peace and abundance, like the Garden of Eden in Genesis. We see this word again in Revelation 2, right at the end of the Bible, where John delivers Jesus' message to his church, when Jesus says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise, same word, of God. Now, paradise points to what we usually just refer to as heaven, but in John's vision in the book of Revelation, it points to the new heaven and new earth, the, the redemption and restoration of all things, where Jesus will come and reign forever, and we will serve him and reign with him in new spiritual bodies. But at the center of what Jesus calls paradise here are two words. He says, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, we are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So what Jesus is saying to this man, what the Apostle Paul is affirming to us is that the promise of Jesus, the promise of eternal life, the promise of our eternal home is that we will be with him. With him. In John chapter 14, when his disciples are worried about death, Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Finally, Jesus promises, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Today. Not if they're spending eons in purgatory, burning off leftover sins, which is, by the way, not a biblical doctrine. He says, today. Not after several hundred thousand years of soul sleep, today. Meaning at the moment of physical death, those who trust in Christ are immediately in the presence of Jesus. Now, this is a mystery to us. It's a mystery because Scripture also teaches that we will not receive our new spiritual bodies in which we will dwell and serve forever until Jesus comes again. But we will be in his presence in a spiritual paradise, of which the Apostle Paul said, no mind has even conceived imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. What the psalmist says when he says, uh, in your presence is fullness of joy. Here's what I see. Just like my friend Charlotte, the man dying on the cross next to Jesus has no chance to be baptized, no chance to go to a Bible study class, no chance to become the member of a church, no chance to demonstrate any life change at all because he's minutes away from death. But because he cries out, Jesus, remember me. Jesus promises today, today you'll be with me in paradise. Years ago, uh, when I was going through seminary, I was required to complete a couple of semesters of what was called clinical pastoral education, CPE for short. Uh, it just meant I had to serve as a student chaplain in a large suburban hospital for several semesters. 
uh, for experience. So a couple days a week, I had to serve under a head chaplain and visited patients that I had never met before, offer some sort of spiritual support, conversation, and sometimes prayer. My last semester um, in this assignment, I was assigned to um, an oncology wing in a large hospital. So it was dedicated to caring for patients who were struggling with some form of cancer. One morning when I reported to my wing, the head nurse said, I need you to go to such and such a room. There's a man there who's, uh, who's nearing the end. He needs a visit. So I walked down to the room number, walked in. I could see a man, uh, an older man lying on a bed. Uh, it seemed like he was asleep. Uh, I could tell by his skin tone, kind of grayish, uh, and the gauntness of his face that, that death perhaps was near. Uh, but he was asleep. But as I approached the bed, he woke up and lifted his head up and looked at me, and he said, who in that blank are you? And I was a bit taken back because nobody ever responded that way when you walked in as a chaplain. Uh, I kind of stammered through, well, I'm a, I'm, I'm a student, student's chaplain. I'm a, in seminary and pointed to my little name tag that said student chaplain on it. And then this man sort of growled at me. He said, I don't need a blankety blank chaplain. He cursed at me. I stopped dead in my tracks. Wasn't sure what to do next. So I, was, I already felt inadequate. Like, what do I have to offer someone facing what he's facing? And so I said, sorry. And I, I slowly backed out of the room and went on with my day. But the next day, I couldn't get that man out of my mind because I, I knew he did need a ch chaplain. Because I knew he did need Jesus. So I knew I had to go back to his room and try again. So the next day, I went straight back to the wing, walked straight to the room and walked in and the bed was empty. And to this day, I re regret leaving that room when he cursed at me. I wish I had stayed through the cursing and the bitterness and the anger and the pain. I wish I had been able to, in some way, tell him the story of the three crosses, of the man in the middle cross and the man who just said, remember me. There were three crosses on the hill that day. The man on the middle cross offered forgiveness and the guarantee of eternal life. And the man on one of those crosses rejected that offer and mocked him. But the man on the third cross responded with repentance and faith and took hold of the middle cross and said, remember me, and received his life replacement guarantee in full. And that's the beautiful and scandalous forgiveness of Jesus. But here's the point today, and really the point of this whole series we've been in, and that is that Jesus wants to meet us, each one of us. He wants to meet you personally. He wants you to know his forgiveness his promise, his life, and he wants you to know it today. Today. You don't have to wait until your final breath because none of us know when that breath is. Today. Cry out or whisper quietly in your heart of hearts, Jesus, remember me too. Will you bow with me as we pray and close? Lord, thank you for your word today, and thank you for the terrible beauty of this story, for the ugliness of the cross, for the ugliness of sin and death, and thank you for the beauty and power of your forgiveness. And may each person within the sound of my voice, whether here today or watching online, may each one know and receive your promise of life today. Today. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. I love that last line. Oh, love that finds me where I am. I pray that his love has found you right where you are.
Our benediction today comes from Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 3. May we go now in the name of Jesus. And may you grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And may you know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen.